welcome to the Astro Guy Podcast. I'm not an expert, I'm an amateur like you. I'm here to learn and here to teach. So let's enjoy the ride together. Carpe Noctum, seize the night. I'm your host, Wayne Zool, and this is the Astro Guy Podcast. This is the first of a series of episodes I'm calling The Great Astronomers. I hope that you'll enjoy this episode as well as the others in the series, which will be released over time. Whether you've been listening since the start of the Astro Guy Podcast, or if this is your first episode, you're in for a treat. In this episode, we're going to take a look at the famous astronomer, Charles Messier, who's been mentioned in nearly every episode of this podcast. His catalog of objects spans the entire night sky, and some of the very best objects to observe are the Messier objects, or M objects, as they're commonly called. But let's start at the beginning of the story. Charles Messier was born on June 26, 1730, in Badalvier, France. He was the tenth of twelve children in his family. As a young teenager, he was enthralled at the appearance of the great six-tailed comet of 1744. This bright comet inspired Messier, and then just four years later, an annular eclipse was visible from Messier's home, broadening his interest in the science of astronomy and comets in particular. At the age of 21, Messier took a job with Joseph Nicolas de Lisle, the astronomer for the French Navy. De Lisle wanted Messier to document his observations as his assistant, but in two years, Messier's own observations were recognized and recorded. His observation of Mercury's transit of the Sun on May the 6th, 1753, is the first known published observation by Charles Messier. He began making his observations from the French Naval Observatory and the Hotel de Clunay in Paris. Messier loved comets and wanted to discover them. In his lifetime, he discovered or co-discovered 15 comets. Two of Messier's comet discoveries became bright naked eye comets. The fifth comet he discovered, 1769 P1, is sometimes referred to as Napoleon's Comet, as it was discovered within a week of Napoleon's birth. This was something Messier pushed later in life to gain favor with the Emperor. As a side note, the Great Comet of 1811 was interpreted by many people of the time as a sign that Napoleon was going to invade Russia, and this was also called Napoleon's Comet. Getting back to 1769 P1, this was classified as a great comet. It is a periodic comet that orbits the Sun every 2,090 years. In 1769, it brightened to magnitude zero, and according to several reports, its tail spanned 97 degrees across the sky, more than halfway from horizon to horizon. This discovery brought Messier his first taste of fame, but less than a year later, Messier would discover his second great comet that made a close approach to Earth in the summer and fall of 1770. The comet was named Comet Lexel, after Anders Johann Lexel, who calculated its orbit. The great comet of 1770 became known as the closest observed comet to Earth passing a mere 1.4 million miles from Earth. This record would stand until 1999, when the SOHO spacecraft discovered a comet that came within 1 million miles of Earth. The Great Comet of 1770 had its closest approach to Earth on July 1st of that year. Its coma spanned nearly 2.5 degrees, more than four times the apparent diameter of the Moon. It had a long tail and was easily seen with the naked eye. An English astronomer of the time noted that in 24 hours, the comet traversed 42 degrees across the stellar background. Messier was the first 
and the last person to observe the comet. For many years after its approach to Earth, it was considered to be a lost comet. Recent calculations based on orbital data from when it was discovered and observed have revealed that the comet's orbit was perturbed by Jupiter's gravity. Modern day astronomers have determined that it's highly likely that the asteroid 2010 JL33 is the remnant of the great comet of 1770, but we may never know for sure. So having discovered two great comets, Messier might now be considered a minor figure in astronomical history, but it was his quest for finding comets that caused him to compile a list of false comets that eventually became the Messier catalog. Messier wanted to record the position of diffuse objects that appeared to look like a telescopic comet, but they were actually nebulae, galaxies, or star clusters. Messier collaborated with his friend, Pierre McCain, who was an astronomer and surveyor. McCain is credited with discovering at least 20 of the objects in Messier's catalog. After several years of observations from Paris using a 4-inch refractor, Messier published his first catalog in 1774 in the Journal of the French Academy of Sciences in Paris. The initial catalog contained 45 objects. This was revised in the year 1780 when the list was expanded to 80 deep sky objects. The final version of Messier's catalog was published in 1784 and was comprised of 103 objects. During the 1920s and through the 1960s, seven more objects were added to Messier's catalog bringing the total to 110 objects. Notes and writings were reviewed by astronomers and historians, and Messier or McCain likely alluded to those final seven objects. Only two of the objects in Messier's list were not true deep sky objects. M40 is a double star in Ursa Major, and M73 is an asterism of four stars in Aquarius. Besides those two non-objects, Messier cataloged one supernova remnant, one star cloud in the Milky Way, four planetary nebulae, six emission nebulae, and one reflection nebula. The most common objects in the catalog are star clusters. He cataloged 29 globular clusters, which are made up of tens of thousands to more than a million old stars in each one. He also cataloged 26 open clusters, which are made of younger stars and usually contain several dozen to several hundred stars in them. Messier cataloged 40 galaxies, although at the time they were thought to be nebulae within the Milky Way. It wasn't until 1924 when Edwin Hubble was able to prove that galaxies existed beyond the Milky Way. Without going through all the objects in the list, we'll touch on some of the more famous M objects in the catalog. Going in numerical order, we start with M1, the Crab Nebula in Taurus. This is the only supernova remnant on the list, and it was actually observed when the star exploded in the year 1054 AD by Chinese astronomers. This object is well studied, and the Crab Pulsar, discovered in the 1960s, has helped us learn a great deal about what happens when a star goes supernova. In the summer skies, there are many bright M objects to see, as the summer Milky Way holds many of them. Of note are three nebulae in Sagittarius. The Lagoon Nebula, M8, is one of the brightest and largest emission nebula in the sky. Nearby are M16 and M17, the Eagle Nebula and the Omega Nebula, respectively. M16 was made famous by an image from the Hubble Space Telescope dubbed the Pillars of Creation. This is likely one of the most viewed images that Hubble has taken. M13 is known as the Great Cluster in Hercules. It is one of the largest and brightest globular clusters that is visible in the Northern Hemisphere. Because it appears high in the sky from most of the US and Europe, 
It is widely observed and can be seen with the naked eye from a dark location. Sagittarius is also home to M22, the brightest globular cluster in Messier's catalog at magnitude 5.1. It is more than half a degree across, making it one of the largest globular clusters in apparent diameter. M27 is known as the Dumbbell Nebula in the constellation Vulpecula. It is a relatively bright planetary nebula and can be spotted with binoculars from a dark sky. One of the true gems of Messier's catalog is M31, the great galaxy in Andromeda. Best seen in the summer and autumn months, this galaxy can be spotted with the naked eye from a moderately dark location. Binoculars or a telescope will reveal tremendous detail. M32 and M110 are considered to be satellite galaxies of M31. At only 2.2 million light years away, M31 is one of the most distant objects that you can observe with the naked eye. M42 is the Great Nebula in Orion. It is part of a large structure of a mission nebula and is easy to see with the naked eye as a fuzzy patch in the middle of Orion's sword. This is one of the few deep sky objects that you can observe color with, provided that you're under a dark sky and you're using a large telescope. You can photograph this nebula with a camera on a tripod. Set the ISO to 1600, you can play around with that and open the shutter for anywhere between one and six seconds if you're using a 50 millimeter lens. You'll be surprised at how much more the image will show, and you should be able to easily pick up the reddish hues of the nebula. M44 is the Beehive Cluster, an open cluster in Cancer, and is large, bright, and easy to see. But the brightest open cluster in the night sky is the Pleiades, M45, in Taurus. This cluster is easy to see even from a moderately light polluted location. I live about 17 miles from New York City and I can easily spot M45 from my yard. In binoculars, this cluster will reveal several dozen member stars. It is a joy to observe. M51 is the Whirlpool Galaxy in Canis Venatici. This galaxy is what many people think of when they hear the word galaxy. It is relatively easy to see in a small telescope, and in a four inch or larger telescope from dark skies, you can make out the spiral structure of the galaxy. M57 is the famous ring nebula in Lyra. This bright little object is a remnant of a star that has gone nova, making it very similar to M27 in its formation. Yet because of our perspective, the two objects look completely different. Ursa Major features M81 and M82, Bode's Galaxy and the Cigar Galaxy, respectively. They are easy to spot in the same binocular field. In a telescope at low power, you can see both of these galaxies in the same field as they are about half a degree apart from each other in the sky. M82 is also the closest starburst galaxy to Earth and has been studied very closely by astronomers. M101 in Ursa Major is known as the Pinwheel Galaxy and one look at it explains how it got its name. Under a dark sky you can spot M101 in binoculars, but in a telescope at low powers it reveals its spiral nature. It is one of the finest examples of a face-on spiral galaxy. The last object from the list that we'll talk about is M104, the Sombrero Galaxy in the constellation Virgo. Glowing at ninth magnitude, you can spot M104 with binoculars from a dark location, but observing it with a telescope will show the dark dust lane that bisects the galaxy, giving it its name. This is just a sampling of some of the best objects in Messier's catalog. There are a few nights in the year, in late March, where you can try to observe all of them in one night. I've tried it a few times, and I was able to log more than 90 of them in a night. But these gems deserve a longer time in the eyepiece, so that you can study and enjoy them.
Charles Messier died at age 86 on April 12, 1817. He is buried at the Paris Lachaise Cemetery in Paris. There is a crater on the moon named for him, as well as the asteroid 7359 Messier. Do you have a favorite Messier object? Let us know what your favorites are. We would love to see any pictures or sketches of M objects that you've made. Well, that's all for this episode. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I've hoped that you found our time together to be fun and helpful. If you have questions or episode suggestions, please email us at astroguypodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 973-404-0380. If you're not already a member, please join the Astro Guy Podcast group on Facebook. You'll find other members, videos, blogs, and other useful information there for your enjoyment. You can also visit our YouTube channel, The Astro Guy Podcast, for past episodes and other surprises. Thank you again for listening, and may your skies be clear. As always, Carpe Noctum, seize the night. I'm Wayne Zool, and this was the Astro Guy Podcast. Thank you for listening. As always, your questions, comments, and suggestions are welcome. Keep wondering. Keep your eyes on the sky. Have fun. Carpe Noctum. Seize the night.